here. Let's lift up your hands, right? Let's worship Him. Hallelujah. Let's sing that song again. to you this morning, God. This is your mighty army. Use it as your will to build your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said? Amen, amen and amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I want you to just hug one another and say, I'm a, tell them I'm a kingdom builder. Thank you, worship team. Praise the Lord. God is good. It's good to see a great group of women here this morning. I just want to thank God. I want to thank God for my salvation, first and foremost. And, and uh, I just want to thank God because God is so faithful. He is a faithful, faithful God. And just to see uh, Zella, what? Zanel, Zanel. So now come up here and preach that word. I mean, I was broken right there. That was a powerful word of God. And, you know, one of the things that we do need to learn is to be broken. And I'm going to kind of like just continue on that vein because God wants to do something special here. You know, God touched my heart when I was 15 years old. Just looking at what God is doing, how God is evolving our ministry. You know, seeing all that God has done. Coming in as a young girl, I wasn't married at the time. But yet, seeing God just draw us and woo us all the time. But so many times, sometimes we ignore the wooing of the Holy Spirit. You know, and we could get comfortable. And I thank God, I thank God for our founders, Pastor Sonny and Sister Julie. I thank them. I thank them because they are our anchor. We may sway to the left, to the right, and then we have these meetings. He brings all of us together and boom, drops the plumb line, reminds us of the vision. You're able to see how far you got off track. And he brings us right back. This is who we are. This is what you're called for. This is why you're in this army. This is why you're in this ministry. Why? Because God called you and I and gave us a purpose here in Victory Outreach International. Amen? In spite of our struggles and our hang-ups. And maybe even our shipwrecks. God is here. God has kept us, amen? Well, I want to talk about this morning about rare breed. 
God wants to raise up a rare breed. Because it's going to take a rare breed that will continue to move with relentless pursuit. There's no way that you could continue the race. Continue this relentless pursuit if it doesn't cost you somebody something. And it takes a rare breed of women that need to rise up. Because God isn't a God that starts and just, you know, you know, just falls apart at the end. No, he continues. He, the word of God says that he goes from glory to glory. He doesn't decline. He continues to go forward, but it's up to you and I to stay focused and continue to press in even when we don't feel like it, right? A rare breed. And, you know, the Lord gave me this scripture, actually this, um, this word when um, I was uh, in need of something for our gang girls. Because I began to see how a lot of our gang girls were struggling. And, and they were like, um, they needed to know how special they were, how special they are. And, um, and I was praying for them. And, you know, I was interceding. And I was binding and rebuking the things that I saw that the enemy was. I was trying to, to, to pray against the lies of the enemy that would come against them. And uh, the, Lord, the Lord gave me this scripture, this meaning. And a rare breed in the urban dictionary, okay? In the urban dictionary, I don't know if they'll put it back there. Yeah. It says, a person who is different and unique from all. A rare breed is, a special, is special and stands out from everyone. Rare breeds outshine all around, and are destined for greatness. Rare breeds are usually beautiful and are unique in style and fashion. Ooh, I like that one. And you know, that's what the Lord gave me that. He goes, you need to go tell these young girls that they're a rare breed. They're special. I'm going to use this rare breed. But was it, what does rare actually mean? To be rare means a rare is something that is unusual, something that is not common. And that's who you and I are. We're not, we're not, we're, we're unusual, we're uncommon. Who would get up in the morning and come over here? Right? Who would stay up all night at Prayer Mountain? It's cold up there. But we were on a mission. It was United Prayer International. And we said, we got our region together, and we said, we're going to do something different. We're going to do something out of the ordinary because we're believing for greatness. Amen? We're believing that God's going to move in our sacrifice, in our, when our eyelids are like falling asleep, you know, we're nodding out in the middle of our prayers, you know. But that's okay. But you press in. You press through. That's being unusual. That's uncommon. What do, you, what do we normally do at home once you start feeling that nod coming? Time to go to sleep. <laughs> My body needs rest. But have you ever tried to keep it up? And tell you know, you know what, Flesh, you're not going to go to sleep. You're going to stay awake. I'm going to wake you up. I'm going to stand up. I'm going to walk. In the name, I'm going to praise your name no matter how I feel. You're worthy of it all, Lord. You are the king of glory. You are the lily of my valley right now. You are the bright and morning star. You are my Lord and king. A rare breed is able to display courage, courage. And I love how she shared the alabaster, the woman with the alabaster bottle. She displayed courage, rare courage, to go in there in the midst of all the men 
and love on Jesus. That's the type of woman that God is looking for today. Unusually excellent. Unusually admirable. Fine. My husband says, fine like wine. <laughs> God wants us to be fine. Breed. What does that mean, breed? A rare breed. A, the word breed means, it, it means to produce, to pro, pro, procreate, to produce, you know, you, you, you produce that rare breed animal. How many of you like dogs? And, you know, if you want that rare breed, I like Maltese. I know many of you have different, uh, boxers, you know. My sister-in-law had a Maltese, and, and as soon as she got her Maltese, we were all like, I want one, I want one, can I have one? As soon as the babies were born, everybody <laughs> wanted a dog. Why? We wanted that rare breed, that nice breed, that beautiful rare breed. And, and, and that's what God is doing here amongst Victory Outreach United Women in Ministry. We are that rare breed. You know, because it takes, it takes a specific species of people to come up and keep the vision pure, untainted. Keep it pure, unadulterated. But you got to keep the gospel pure and unadulterated in order for you to keep the vision pure. Amen? And I want us to turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. We're going to talk about a rare breed. He was definitely a rare breed. And um, I want to talk about what this rare breed servant of God, what he was called to do. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 2. Chapter 3, verse 2. And the word of God, well, let's start in verse 1. Better. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And it also talks, if you read in, um, well, the king, it says, verse 3, this is he who has spoken of, through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, making straight the path for him. John clothed, John's clothes were made of camel hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and honey. Now that to me is a rare man. <laughs> he is definitely a rare breed. But just like he had an assignment, he was birthed and raised for an assignment. You and I have been birthed and raised for an assignment. We have an assignment in life. And we live our lives, if we understand our purpose in life, you could fulfill it in spite of life's struggles and challenges. And I want to talk about John the Baptist. His main objective was to preach repentance. That was his main calling, to make way for the Lord. God Almighty. It says, prepare the way for the Lord, making straight the path for him. Making straight the path through repentance. Because there was only one way, right? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way. And John was being used in this manner to preach this this to preach the message of repentance because the kingdom of heaven was near. And I want to talk about repentance this morning. I just really feel that we need to understand what repentance means. Because in order for us to do what 
was taught this morning, brokenness, it stems from somewhere. It stems from understanding what true repentance is. And I think because we come to church all the time and we do our religious, you know, um, schedule, we come to church, we get involved in events, we serve here, we do that, we're, we become sometimes very event orientated. Very easy to do. And th you know how you, you, you know you become event orientated? When you start bucking with your sisters that are working alongside of you. You start getting angry with each other. Did you hear what she said? Oh, she didn't like this. Oh, she's criticizing how you did this. Oh, she forgot it again? Man, she's not a team player. She can't even put a little bit of her finances to make this work. You start quarreling with each other. Now you're no longer a team player. There's a problem here. You've, you've become event-orientated. There are signs of being event-orientated. And it becomes familiar. And then we forget why we do what we do. Because what you do displays that the kingdom of heaven is near. If you understand what you're doing and why we do it. Because bottom line, it's for souls. Somebody came and shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with us, right? I want you to take a moment right there in your tables. When somebody came to share salvation with you or share the gospel with you, could you remember the scripture that they used to share the word of God with you? I want you to just take a minute. What was the one scripture that was used that it, to introduce you into the, to the gospel? Introduce you to Jesus. I want you to just take a, take a minute. Share it with the person next to you. What scripture? Go down memory lane. Some of you have to go way back. You know, sometimes it's even a shame that we even forget those scriptures. One of them is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall have everlasting life. Romans 10, 9. That if you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart that Jesus has risen from the dead, you shall be saved. Right? John 3, 3, Jesus answered and said, Truly and truly I say unto you, unless one is born again, born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 1, 11, 12. He came to his own and those who, who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, he gave them the right to become children of God, even those who believed in his name. Scriptures that we would use to introduce Jesus, introduce the gospel to many others. And you know, we're getting ready to do Code Red. And I think we need to brush up on some of these scriptures. Amen? We need to brush up on some of these scriptures to remind you why you're here, why you're saved. True repentance, true repentance, simple, simple. We're walking the way that satisfies us. We're walking in the way of the world. Many of us were there. We were all there. But when somebody came and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, we recognized that there was sin here, right? 
And when we said, Jesus, I accept you into my life. Come into my heart. Take control of my life. I believe that you have died and you risen again. And you're seated at the right hand of the Father. Come into my heart. Sit in the throne of my heart. When we made that declaration, things changed in our life. And there was a turnaround. We said, we're not going to live like this no more. We're going to live in pursuit of what the heart of God, the word of God. We're going to change our lifestyle. We're going to change the way we talk. We're going to change the way we do business. We're going to change in the way we treat one another. We're going to change. Although some of it is our responsibility to change and some of it the Holy Spirit does it. Why? Because he begins to sanctify you and I. He sanctifies us. There's that progressive sanctification. Some of us in the process of turning around, we slipped and fall. We fell and we got ourselves back up or there was somebody that picked us up and said, you know what? It's okay. You're going to make it. Just confess. Ask God to forgive you. Get yourself back up and keep going. Right? And we did this several times over and over. But you know that once we've been safe for a long time, we stop asking God to forgive us of our sins. Because all of a sudden, our sins have begun, have been, all of a sudden, our sins, they're not sins, they're weaknesses. Or it's not bad anymore. Right now, I am in the fight, spiritual fight in my house. Right now. You know, you think it's over. First you raise one group of kids, and then all of a sudden the next group of kids, you got, you, got, you know, my grandchildren. They're fighting. And I'm, I'm saying, God, God, you have to show them the truth, God. You have to show them the truth because they're trying to mix sin with Christianity. How can I make it work? You know what? You guys did it. So you know what? I like it too. I go, but son, you don't have to do it. I'm sharing with you, you don't have to go down that road. But you know what? Some, some may have to go down that road so that they could find their divine, their divine crossroads with God. But you know what I'm praying for? That God would open their hearts. That God would show them the truth. Because God, Jesus Christ, is the truth. He's the way maker. And right now, I'm fighting in the spirit realm. I'm saying, Lord, take the blinds off their eyes. Many of you moms aunts, um, and aunts that are here, grandmothers, you are the intercessor that your children need. You see them struggling. You should feel their struggle. You should feel their pain, even though they you out stuff that doesn't that may hurt you you put on the full armor of God and know that greater is he that is within you greater is he that is within you can overcome but he just but our, sometimes our children don't, don't understand that just like Zanel was saying I don't understand this process God I don't understand it's not fair that there's sickness in my house. That I've lost a loved one. I don't understand. Our children are there. But we have to be their anchor. We need to be their intercessor. True repentance is a true turner, turning around to Christ. It involves making a decision to turn from sin to salvation in Christ. It's simple. Sometimes we could forget that repentance involves a change of lords. Who are you serving this morning? Who are you serving? Who's lord of your life? Who have you given authority and power over your life? Because that's your lordship. Whether it's the world, society, the enemy, or Jesus Christ. Who's your Lord? You know that sometimes we have, we exchange him? Or we put one on and we take the other one off? Because that's what my, 
That's what I see happening in our young, our young people. They don't know how to keep on the lordship of Jesus Christ. Because when they're with their friends, they're with somebody else. You know, and they're struggling. They're struggling. Who's Lord? Who's Lord? The friends, the peer pressure. Come on, it's not too bad. Come on, do it. And then you come to church, and now Jesus Christ is Lord. Because now you're in the midst of believers. See, it's, it's important not to forsake the assemblies of the brethren. There's a reason why God says that. Because there's power when, when, when we're together. There's power in unity. Amen? And if, Lord, if Jesus Christ is Lord of your life, then that means this word is Lord of your life as well. You're not going to change it. You're not going to try to compromise it. You're not going to try to twist it. You know, the world does that. We need to be women that are constantly growing in the things of God. Amen? Let's, let's read on in chapter 3, same chapter. Let's for, read in verse 8. Because here it talks about repentance produces fruit. It says here, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think that you say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the tree, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. See, here we see there, there's fruit in repentance. What kind of fruit? Because genuine repentance will show its fruit in righteousness, making you and I in right standing with God. It will just be displayed in our deeds. I want you to turn to Luke 3, chapter 3.10. And I'm, I want you to read how, how Jesus spoke to, to, to some of them here and how he told them, you need to change your deeds, and this is how you do it. Luke 3.10. Here, verse 10. What shall we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, the man who has two tunics, share with him who has none. And the one who has food, do the same. Tax collector also came to, him to be baptized. Teacher, they, they asked, what shall we do? Don't collect more than that is required, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what shall we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. See, the deeds were changing. The actions were changing. And so it should be with us constantly. The Holy Spirit will always speak to you when you're doing something wrong. He will remind you. Why? Because he's walking alongside of you. That's what the word declares when we accept Jesus Christ into our hearts. The Holy Spirit walks alongside of us. And he's guiding us and leading us. Our deeds should change. Your actions, your, your way of thinking should change. There should be a, a mindset that is Christ-like. What are these deeds displaying? They're displaying what a Christian should look like, sound like, act like. You see how it all, there's the image of Christ flowing through us. The image of Christ that God wants to bring forth in our lives. See, true saving faith and conversion is evident through godly fruit. There's a conversion. There's a transformation, which means that we keep growing. You keep changing. 
You don't stay the same. It doesn't matter how long you've been saved. The basics are the basics. The word of God is the word of God. You cannot change the word of God. We're either going to bear good fruit. You're either going to be tied to the vine or you're not. And the word of God says here that if you're not, the axe is already at the root of the tree. It's already at the root of the tree, ready to get cut off. Why? Because you're not, we're not producing a Christ-like image. We're not exemplifying the living Christ, the powerful Christ, the supernatural Christ, the healing Christ, the deliverance, and the power of the blood that was shed on Calvary. We're not displaying that. A rare breed understands how rare she is, how special. Those who say they believe in Christ and are God's children and don't produce good fruit in their lives are like trees that will be cut down and thrown into the fire. That's exactly what it says. I want you to turn to Luke again. Let's turn to Luke. 24. I'm going to close with this one, I think. God knows what he's doing. I think God wants to remind us. We're going to get to code red. You and I, we have the privilege and the opportunity to walk people into the kingdom of God, just like people have walked us into the kingdom, brothers and sisters, who were standing at their posts at the right time, at the right place. Divine connections, divine encounters are going to take place in code red. And that, it shouldn't just be code red. It should be all the time at your workplace. It should be in your home. It should be at your church. It should be in the streets. It should be at the park playing with your kids. It should be at that, at that baseball field, football field, whatever. If you live a life of a rare breed in Christ, you understand your purpose. Every day you wake up, God, what is it that you want me to do? What connection? What words? But if you don't get up, there's no discipline in your life whatsoever. We've been saved 15, 10, 20, 30 years, and you have no discipline. I believe God's challenging us. You and I are a rare breed. If you've been saved for, for a while, you should have already, man, have a routine, getting up in the morning, Man, having your appointment with the, your father, your heavenly father, the God that is a good God, he's a good God to you because you're not, we're not where we used to be. He's brought us along. He's been a good father to you and I. We can't ignore our relationship with the father. Amen? Amen. And I believe God's preparing us for, for, for us to, re, to reap a harvest. Yeah. But we need to understand that even we have to repent. Yeah. Where are you? What's your condition? What does it look like? Have you heard yourself? What is coming out of your mouth? What are you putting on your mouth? <laughs> You know, what do you look like? What are you wearing? Do you display the excellence of God? Luke 24, 45 and 7. 45. Then he opened their mind. They could understand the scripture so that they, they could understand the scripture. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sin will be preached in the name, in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. We've been called to the nations. And the, na and, and the word and the gospel of Jesus Christ came to us. 
and we received repentance and we believe that Jesus Christ came into our hearts. But now it's our turn to take it out there. Now it's our turn. We got to take it out there. See, because it says right here, what did he do? He opened their minds so that they can understand the scriptures. Repentance and forgiveness of sin. That's what he opened the mind, our minds to understand. That there is a repentance and there's a forgiveness of sin. So when you and I come before the presence of God, a holy God, that you need to understand that whatever God is leading you to repent, you need to repent. You cannot go any further of where you're at right now in your understanding with the word of God or in, of God. How can he, he, he even give you more? He can't because you haven't learned to repent and ask God to forgive you of your sins. See, if we don't preach, if a preacher shares salvation on the basis of an easy faith, an easy faith, or by accepting salvation without a commitment to obey Christ and his word, he preaches a false gospel. And I think that that's where we're at right now. We're in danger of preaching a false gospel. Because we want to make salvation easy. The word of God says that wide is the road to destruction. And narrow, narrow is the ro road to salvation. To eternal life. As a rare breed, women of God that are relentless pursuit of fulfilling our calling and our purpose in life. You need to understand where we're at. Understand where your children are at. Understand where your grandchildren. Understand where your ministry is at. Where God has put you is key. Again, repentance is forsaking, turning around. Not doing what you're doing in your former life, but doing what God has called you to do. We're about to do code red, ladies. When was the last time you asked God to forgive you of your sins? Or when have you made an excuse? You know, I think one of our biggest problems right now is that there's so much pride in our hearts that we refuse. We could call somebody else's sin, sin. And like I said, we could call ours a weakness. And you know, we tolerate our sin. We justify our sin. We justify our, bat, our, our actions. Well, they deserved it. You know, we could say, we justify it. But if in the light of the word of God, God wants us to do things with sincerity of heart, pure intentions. That's what James says. Pure heart, sincerity, sincere faith. God says to be holy for he is holy. You know, sometimes it's not about, you know, on the outside or anything. I, I believe it's in the heart. It's, everything is inside. And I, I, this morning, I want us to just come before the presence of God. Let's learn to repent. God, cleanse me. Renew me. Father, you know my mind. You know the struggles. You know the doubts. How can chains be broken if you don't recognize that there's yokes that you're battling? There's generational curses. They're there. you got to break them off yourself to break them off your children and your grandchildren. That Those curses are not going to continue. And when that door is open again, the Holy Spirit is going to say, look, that door's open right there. Close it. Don't give the enemy an inch. Begin to pray over your house, anointing. Walk around the premises of your house. Release the mighty angels of the Spirit of God. Release the angels, ministering angels, warring angels, healing ministers to come upon your family. A rare breed recognizes the season in which she's in. 
a rare breed God is looking for. God wants to raise in the third wave. Six to be in the center of God's will. And if you need revival this morning, I'm telling you, if you need revival this morning, you find revival in the altar right here. This is where revival is cultivated in brokenness, repentance. More of you, God, less of me. More of you and less of me. I need you, Jesus. I want you to come on up. What do you need this morning? Where are you at this morning? God, I need you. I can't do it without you. I need your healing power. Fill me, Lord. Fill me with your spirit. Cleanse me. Make me anew this morning, Father. Oh, Spirit of God. Spirit of God, take control. Move by your spirit, God. We need more of you. Prepare us for cold red. Lord God, I pray right now, God. We ask for forgiveness of our sins. This morning, we come to you acknowledging, God, that we need you. 